And we're going to take a look at one of Jesus' disciples named Thomas. More than likely, everybody in this room has heard about Thomas before. And you've probably heard of him being referred to as Doubting Thomas. But who was Thomas? We're going to take a look at that. If you'll turn to John chapter 11, verse 16. And you guys, I'm terrible at marking my pages. You think I'd do better. I know that I'm going to be talking on this. I'd probably, you know, move a little bit faster if I marked it, but I didn't. John 11, verse 16. Then Thomas, called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too, so that we may die with him. Now what has just happened is Lazarus has died. Jesus is telling them, Lazarus is dead. We're going to go back to Galilee. We're going to, we're going to go see him. And the disciples don't think that this is necessarily a good idea. But Thomas pipes up and he says, well, let's go too so that we may die with him. Now, whether or not he's being sarcastic or he's being supportive, I don't know, that's left up for interpretation. But this is, this is what Thomas said. If we look at John chapter 14, verse five, and I gotta turn there again. Jesus is telling them that he's going away. I'm going to back up just a little bit. We'll start with uh, 14.1. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Or verse 5, Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Thomas is an inquisitive disciple. He has questions. What do you mean we know the way? We don't know where you're going. And Jesus answers Thomas. Jesus always answers Thomas. Like the rest of the disciples, Thomas gave up everything that he had, his whole lifestyle, his job, probably his family, everything to follow Jesus. And like the rest of the disciples, more than likely Thomas thought, this is cool. We are following the Messiah, the guy who's going to set up this new kingdom and overthrow the Romans, and we're going to get to rule with him. We're probably going to be in a position of authority and power and have all this prestige. This is great. This was really what probably most of the disciples were thinking. So I, I studied probably about seven or eight years ago now, I, I listened to this study about what it took to become, <coughs> excuse me, a rabbi, and what it meant to be a disciple. If somebody wanted to become a rabbi, they went through extensive training from the time they were just tiny little boys, and they had to memorize lots and lots and lots of scripture, and they had to follow their teaching rabbi around wherever they went. If their rabbi that they were learning under went to sleep at 7 o'clock in the evening, they went to sleep at 7 o'clock in the evening. If they decided to eat cornbread and hot dogs at midnight, they ate cornbread and hot dogs at midnight. I don't know if they had corn dogs, cornbread and hot dogs, and I don't know. But whatever their teaching rabbi did, they did. And it was an honor to get to study and learn under certain rabbis. Then there came a point where the rabbi students would have to test. And these tests were strenuous. They were difficult. They would ask them sometimes the most obscure questions to try to trip them up. And if for some reason they didn't cut the mustard, they didn't get to be a rabbi. Now, we don't know, scripture doesn't tell us, but there's a good chance that many of the disciples following Jesus at one time or another in their life had pursued a career as a rabbi. And possibly Thomas had. But for some reason, he didn't pass the test. 
So we wonder sometimes, or I wonder sometimes, when Jesus walks up to these individual men, these fishermen, these tax collectors, these different people, and he says to them, hey, drop everything and follow me, why in the world would they do that? Because it was an honor. This was a big deal. We know that Jesus was a rabbi. He's called rabbi. He's called teacher. Right? So this was huge. This was a big deal. Well, Thomas may very well have said, this is my second chance. If he had indeed wanted to be a rabbi when he was younger, didn't cut the mustard, didn't pass, maybe didn't get along well with the rabbi he was studying under, who knows. But this Jesus guy comes along, and he's like, second chance, I'm doing it. So he's following Jesus, and for several years he sees all of these miracles that Jesus has performed. He's excited. He thinks that they're going to come into this wonderful kingdom. He has given up everything that he, he's doing to follow Jesus. We know that he had a twin. We're not told anything about his twin brother. We just know that he's called Thomas um, Didymus, which means twin, Thomas twin, and that he was a fisherman from Galilee. We know that much about him. We also know that he saw many of the miracles that Jesus performed. We're going to look at primarily John chapter 20 tonight. And I want to start with uh, John 20, verse 15. But before we do, we know what happens. The disciples are following Christ. They, they come into Jerusalem. They think this is a triumphant entry. All of the people are laying palm branches down. Hosanna, Hosanna. And they're excited. But then things take a turn for the worse. And their rabbi their king, their messiah, the one that has been leading them has been crucified. He's been murdered. And they're lost. And they're scared. And they're brokenhearted. John 20, 15. Jesus, of course, has risen from the dead. Mary has gone to the tomb. She wants to um, take care of his body. But when she gets there, he's not there. 14, she says, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. You see, she thinks she's speaking to the gardener. Woman, Jesus said to her, why are you crying? Who is it that you are seeking? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will take him away. And Jesus says to her, Mary. Turning around, she sees him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So she, he shows himself to Mary. Now let's go to 2019 and 22. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So we know the story. Mary sees Jesus. She runs back. She tells the other. She tells the disciples he's alive. He's risen. And um, now I imagine they're in this room. They're hanging out. Now they've locked the door. Why did they lock the door? Because they were in fear for their very lives. And she's told them, "I saw him. He's alive." I wonder. If maybe they had a little conversation amongst themselves. Well, I don't know. Uh, somebody pu pulled a trick on her. Well, no, he, you know, he did tell us he was going to rise again. Uh, I think that's what he meant when he said, you know, on the third day. And, and they were remembering some of the teachings that he had said. And um, they're all contemplating this. And all of a sudden, 
through a locked door, Jesus comes into the room. He enters the room, and he says, it's me, guys. Do you see my hands? You see the scars on my hands? You see my side? Where they thrust the spear through my side? It's me. It's me. It says, and then they rejoiced. Then they rejoiced. After Jesus shows himself to them, then they rejoiced. But Thomas wasn't there when this happened. Now, can you imagine how heartbroken Thomas must have been? He had given up everything. He had followed. He believed. He really believed they were going to rule. Now, they've all seen Jesus. He hasn't. Thomas is by himself with no hope. His dreams are gone. He doesn't know what to do next. He's broken. Have you ever been that heartbroken? When I was preparing for this uh, message tonight, I had some, uh, a memory come up that I was thinking about, and I remember feeling like Thomas. And I had a hard time just getting through my preparation, so I'm gonna do my best to get through the rest of my message tonight as I share this story with you. A lot of you know that um, we had sold everything, moved away, and went to Israel. And when we came back, before we came back to the United States, we had to start making plans. Where were we going to live? What about jobs? We had to get reestablished, and we knew that. So a few weeks before we came back, we started looking online for houses and jobs and all of those things that you do to navigate in life, right? And we knew we didn't have a whole lot of money to come back with. And um, felt really strongly that we were going to end up in Galveston, Texas. We planned for it, we found houses we could afford. Um, that's where we were going to go. We were sure of it. I said, God, we've, you know, we've done what you told us to do. We came to Israel, we've done all the things you told us to do. Um, yay, we're gonna go get reap our reward. We're gonna get a new house in Galveston, Texas. So after getting home, spending a little time with our kids, it was now time for us to go down to Galveston and start looking for a place to live. We got there, we stayed in a hotel, and nothing that we had planned for came together, nothing. The houses that we were interested in were not habitable, they were terrible houses, they, nothing like the pictures we had seen. Um, we looked at some other houses, financing was a problem because we had given up jobs, we hadn't worked for a while, so we didn't have jobs. And I was devastated. I was as broken as I had been in a very long time. This was not the first time, those of you who know my story, this was not the first time that we had given up everything and ended up homeless to, to follow after what Jesus had told us to do. And I couldn't take it anymore. And I remember very clearly, like very, very clearly, sitting at this little table in the hotel room, and I didn't know what we were supposed to do next. We were homeless, we were running out of money, we didn't have jobs. And I said, God, we did what we were supposed to. We followed after you, we gave up everything, we followed you, and I don't know what to do now. The tears were just falling, dripping on that table. And honestly, I didn't even have the energy to really cry, they just came. I was broken. And I started to wonder very seriously if I had made the biggest mistake of my life. Never should have gone. We never should have sold our house. We shouldn't have done this. This was a mistake. God, why did, what, did I, what was I thinking? Did I actually hear from the Lord? What is going on? We also um, would have had an opportunity to go on another mission trip to Belize. And... I said, I can't do it again. I cannot do it again. I was broken hearted. I had just followed after Jesus and things did not work out the way I thought they were going to work out. And I couldn't do it again. And I imagine that's how Thomas felt as he's off by himself mourning and grieving. And the disciples came to him and said, Thomas, guess what? We saw him. He's alive. And he said, unless I see 
the scars on his hands and his side, I cannot believe. Let's go ahead and, and read on. So we're going to go to uh, 2024. But Tom is called twin. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. A week later, his disciples were indoors again and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. When else did he say this? The first time he showed up through the locked doors, right? Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Yes. Hallelujah. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that quote has gone out throughout history as one of the most famous quotes out there. And we sometimes think that Thomas was being chastised because he had to see to believe, but we forget that Jesus showed himself to Mary and he showed himself to the other disciples too. It wasn't just Thomas that he showed himself to. He showed himself to Mary and he showed himself to the other disciples. It just so happened that Thomas wasn't there the first time, but in his love and in his kindness, he shows up again and he does it again just for Thomas. Amen just for him, just for Thomas. While Thomas was saying, I can't go through this again, guys, you're asking me to believe, and I, I just can't do it. It was too painful. It hurt too much. I loved this man, they killed him. I cannot go through that again. But Jesus, in his supreme love, went through a locked door, and he showed himself to Thomas. Amen. He recognized Thomas' broken heart. His statement seems to us like he's chastising Thomas when he says, you believe because you see. But I don't think he was really chastising so, him so much as he was saying, oh, Thomas, I love you. I love you enough to show myself to you. He loved the other disciples enough to show himself to them too. We have not had the benefit of seeing Jesus in the flesh. We are so blessed. We are so blessed to have not had to go through what the disciples went through when they followed him. Can you imagine having given up everything? You're following him. You're traveling all around the place. You may not know from day to day where your next meal is coming from or where you're going to lay your head, but you have given up everything for this man, Jesus. And all of a sudden, he's taken from you. And now you're in fear for your life. We are so blessed because we have not had to experience that. Hallelujah. But they did. Jesus showed himself to them and he did not believe the words out of man's mouth. Thomas did not believe the words out of just man's mouth. He had to see it. He had to hear it from his Lord. He still recognized him. He still recognized him as his Lord. Sometimes we tell people about Jesus. Sometimes people are hurting, they're mourning, they're grieving, they're in an awful lot of pain. Maybe they've stepped away from the church, they've stepped away from the faith, and we give them what we think are words of comfort. And I'm sure the disciples were trying to tell Thomas, oh really, you don't understand, we've seen him. And maybe there are people in your life where you have said, no, really, he's changed my life and he can do that for you too. Unless he comes to me personally, I cannot believe. And that might be the prayer that we need to pray for some people in our lives, that Jesus would reveal himself to them personally. Where we fail, Jesus will not fail, and he will bust through locked doors and locked hearts to get to people that he wants to get to, that he loves. I know that people try to comfort me. During that time, I had a lot of people in my life telling me, it wasn't for nothing, Laura. God has a plan. You know, all the things that we tell people. And I just couldn't go on. I was broken and I was hurting. 
I had a lot of conversations with God. It wasn't that I didn't believe that he existed. Now, there are people who sometimes don't believe that God exists, and God can show himself to them, too. I've heard a lot of testimonies about that. But I was really hurting, and, and people's words of comfort did not necessarily help me. But what did is that God revealed himself to me in some very personal ways, some prayers that were answered, some things that I um, was contemplating and I needed help with, and God stepped in and, and intervened and helped me with. And slowly, little by little, he began to reveal himself all over to me. Laura, I'm still here. It's okay. And, you know, my life got put back together. I wasn't homeless very long. In fact, we left Galveston, went back to Fort Worth where we had been staying with a friend of ours. And um, that very next day I went to the house. Didn't know I was going to live in Fort Worth for a while, but I did. And life started to get better. We got jobs and life goes on. And God did start to reveal a purpose in my life. I thought maybe I didn't really have a purpose, that he didn't really have a plan for me. But he did, and he revealed himself to Thomas, too. And maybe you have been disappointed or heartbroken with some things in your life. Maybe you've invested a lot into your church, and your church has let you down in the past. Or maybe there's been a death of someone in your life that you weren't ready to lose. Or prayers that went unanswered. And maybe you've questioned God's love, period, or even his existence. But he does love you. He understands that you're brokenhearted. You know, he loved Thomas when Thomas was all gung-ho and on fire and ready to go die with Christ. And he loved him when he was brokenhearted too. It doesn't matter if you're on the mountaintop or in the valley, if things are going great or they're going poorly, he loves you. Amen. Sometimes what happens though is we don't understand the true plan that he has. Thomas didn't understand. He thought they're going to enter into this, this new kingdom where uh, they're going to overthrow the Romans and everything was going to be the way he imagined. Even though Jesus was telling them over and over, that's not it, guys, that's not it. Well, maybe in our own lives we get this idea in our head of how God is supposed to respond to us, how he's supposed to answer our prayers how life is supposed to turn out, and then it doesn't, and we become disappointed. But you know what? He may be saying to you, that's not really where I was taking you. Just come follow me. I love you. You are my, see my hands. I died for you. You see the spear marks in my side? That was for you. I know you're hurting, but I am right here. He loves you even when you're wallowing in your grief. I think it was maybe a little unfair that we have, through, through history, attached this moniker to, to Thomas, and we call him Doubting Thomas, when perhaps he was mourning Thomas, grieving Thomas, hurting Thomas. We sometimes look at his doubt, and we make sermons out of it, and, and classes out of it, and we say, God loves you even when you doubt. And he does. He absolutely does. But I think it went beyond that. I think sometimes maybe we don't necessarily doubt who God is or his existence, but we wonder if we're on the right path, if the things that we are doing for the Lord really matter. And in those moments, he's willing to show himself to us. I have no idea where you're at. You might be where Thomas was when he was ready to go die for Christ and he's all gung-ho and he's all excited and, and on that mountaintop. Or you might be in the valley brokenhearted and some things in your life have not gone the way you thought they would. Wherever you are, Jesus wants to show himself to you. Amen. He wants to show himself to you because he loves you. Amen. So I think Cynthia's going to, well, I guess Lori is going to, play a song for us this evening and if there are things that you want to talk to Jesus about the altars are open we can get a couple of people up here to, um, to pray with people Chuck maybe you can come on up